Hello everybody and welcome back to another video for the day. We're going back in r slash Tales of Duckbeard because you guys seem to have liked that last one I made. So I figured, hey, I might do another one. So if you guys would like to be absolutely amazing, show your support and see more videos like this one in the near future, be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment down below to start up the wholesome internet discussion. Let me know a video game you might like to see in the background, a little subreddit, just something to help get people going because... I really do appreciate the engagement, it helps out the channel a ton. And if you guys have not already, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications. Robin de Baird. The cast is myself, OP, Bree, my friend, Mike, Bree's hot-headed BF, and Robin de Baird. I met this Robin when my dad moved our family from a, my small farming town to a town an hour away. It was during the financial troubles of 2009, 10th grade year of high school, and we found a cheaper rent in a grim little nowhere town in central Florida, where the mathematics flowed freely and the working girls walked up and down the main highway during the morning and late hours. Our high school was one of those places where your only options were the Marines or the NFL. So our school's money went to the JROTC and football programs. Due to schooling being rezoned, our school was split into three groups. The rich kids from a town over, the kids from the projects, and your trailer park kids. The project kids and the trailer kids formed a group of nerdy rap and heavy metal fans. And one clean-cut church-going, 5'11 at the time, big and dorky farm boy. Me, Bree, a 5'2 Puerto Rican rocker chick with red hair and a skinny cute build who loves to fight and that would could also outdrink a sailor, adopted me as her pet project. She was the mom friend of the group of misfits and her boyfriend Mike was the ringleader of the group. Mike was very edgy. He was a short kid from Boston and he had had a bad home life. Think any Irish kid from a Wahlberg movie, and you got him. At his heart of hearts, he was not a bad person, but he was not someone I tried to interact with. We bumped heads a few times, but I talked him down. Ex-coworker once called me a human. Lastly, there was Robin. He was a tertiary friend who sort of hung around with the group. And for the Stargate 1 fans among us, I swear he was a rail. This man gaslighted people so naturally. I swear it was a natural defense mechanism. In his biology, he was skinny, around 5'5", five five. he had strawberry blood, glasses, and he looked like a rat. He had the beardy... He had the beady eyes and rat-like face, which Brie used to joke about him constantly. Robin would mac on every girl in our group. He spent his mornings going around to every girl and asking, Where is my hug? Most of the girls would attempt to brush him off, but he would always just go into this tirade about, Well, we aren't friends, I guess. Nag, nag, nag. Finally, the girls would hug him just to shut him up. A few of the girls would give him attention, thinking that he was the nice guy, and he was being like a brother. He would quickly turn this into rubbing his head deep into their tank tops. This drove their boyfriends insane. Robin, however, would backpedal and say, that is my sister. What, I'm not allowed to hug my sister? He would then somehow get the girl angry at her boyfriend, leaving all of the guys in the group absolutely dumbfounded. Robin's main victim was Bree, and about a middle of our 11th grade year, this act came to a head. I was late getting to school, and when I got to the lunchroom, it was deafening. Mike had Robin up against the wall, Bree was yelling at Mike to stop, and the school admins were hoofing it down the hall from the office. Mike was dragged off by our 6'6 ex-Navy Courtman AP and was carried kicking and screaming into the office. Just imagine a giant albino gorilla with a huge smile and a southern accent in a fine suit. Robin was laying like a corpse, taking small breaths, while the school nurse was checking him out. It took a good five minutes for Robin to catch his breath, and he began whining to the staff, which I did not hear as the school bell rang. In the third period, I learned from Bree what had happened. Robin was doing his usual feeling up on the girls with his head. Well, 
Bree was rather busty. He pushed too hard, and Bree had a Janet Jackson moment. Seeing this, Mike ran up one foot on the stool that was attached to the table and literally cleared the Yu-Gi-Oh game that was going on. He landed his whole weight into Robin, throwing him into the wall. He then started choking and punching Robin. While Robin just stood there and his hands up, Bree was convinced that it was an accident. I attempted to defend Mike, saying, yeah, he went too far, but that was hardly an accident on Robin's part. Bree just went quiet and didn't talk to me for the rest of the class. Mike naturally got into a ton of trouble, and there was a lot of talk about him having to go to the alternative school. There was talk about him getting charges, as at the time there were a zero-tolerance school district, Luckily, our AP was an understanding man. He and the school resource source officer told Robin's mom Mike's side of the story, and Robin's mom denied charges. Mike basically was just not at school for a while, and Robin would turn this, too, into his favor. Robin turned Mike's persona non grata into an opportunity to mack hard on Bree. Bree and I were not really talking, as I kept defending Mike's actions and giving my opinion about her friend. Robin started a campaign to play victim to the girls in the group and to court my favor. He had Bree ask me to be nice to Robin, to which I nicely retorted over my dead body. So, Bree and I didn't talk a lot for about three months. Robin shielded himself by becoming bro to about four girls in the group. I met my best friend junior year, and I went off and hung out more with him. I talked to one of the girls who was dating my friend Tim, who was Bree's best friend. Abby kept me updated on the drama and what Robin was doing. He was on a text messaging campaign every night to Bree to explain how sorry he was for the accident and that he hoped Mike didn't get into too much trouble. He said, Mike just like that, and if he would have let me explain, we could have worked it out. He's just a jealous guy. He really controls you and nag, nag, nag. At the start of senior year, Bree and Robin were dating. It lasted about two to three weeks. For context, Bree is married to John Wayne, Ron Swanson, and Chuck Norris's DNA placed into a blender and cloned. Her husband is a volunteer firefighter who's a woodsman, carpenter, amateur MMA fighter. That is Bree's type of guy. Robin's whiny and needy personality drove Bree absolutely insane. It came to a head when Bree's little sister informed Bree that Robin had been creeping around the ninth graders. Apparently, he was dating about three ninth graders during the month or so that they dated. Bree went off and Robin was basically forced out of the group. Mike came back to school senior year and made up with Bree. Mike was back in the group and Robin was basically afraid to show his face for the rest of the school year. He hung around the ninth graders and still was the where's my hug creep to all of the freshly minted teenage girls. Ah, oh, yeah, lovely. None of that totally screams I'm going to be on a list somewhere in the future. The LGS Nightmare Shameless Profiteering Edition. It's that time. What time is it? Time for the little game shop of horrors. QRD, I work at an LGS in Average Town. It's me and Manny, the manager. I work the busier nights of the week, having been moved over to the those hours because we recently brought on a new employee who's getting a feel for the ropes. Now, my job is 99% chill, but every now and then we have to deal with those guys. Then you guys get a spicy story out of it and we find ourselves here. So it goes without saying that if you are running a business, you're in it to make a profit, right? That is, after all, the hypothetical aims of any business enterprise. This is something greasy old Manny understands very well and puts into practice every day. Albeit not in the most honest of ways. That's why he slices packs open and glues them shut. The profit motive is why any brick and mortar store has markup that beats out online retailers. And on and on and on. 
It also generally goes without saying that you don't want people competing with your bread and butter because that cuts into your bottom line. The more you can corner a market, the better for your wallet. Well, we usually don't have any issues with competitors, being only the only little LGS in our town. But it doesn't always stop uh, entrepreneurs from materializing every so often. Sometimes these upstarts are so shameless that they'd even give Manny a run for his money. It was FML Friday once again, and things were winding down after the draft. The nerds were packing up, the garbage cans were overflowing with shrink wrap and soda cans, maybe some players were lingering about, playing some accessory games after the lineups, opening up their prize packs and gushing over the pulls. So, it was sitting behind the counter, lost in a comic with my day's work done, just wanting to go ahead and go home. Manny had retreated into the back and was doing something or other, moving boxes of merchandise around, pricing things, rolling in his money piles like an oily Scrooge McDuck, whatever. Things were going right, and somebody came walking up to the counter. Magic nerd, yeah, how much will you give me for these? He set several cards down on the display case while I slipped a bookmark into my comic and set it down on the side. My eyes lit up at first glance. He had some very nice mythic rares he wanted to get rid of, but as soon as I picked one up, I knew that something was wrong. The texture was off, to say at least, and while we jokingly referred to Magic the Gathering as cardboard crack here in the industry, these cards felt thin, almost as if Wizards was cutting corners on the cost of recycled boxes. Like, they had decided if they just shaved off an extra millimeter of cardboard that they could net a profit and would pad their books. I took one look at the artwork, and the resolution even felt a little off. And some errors on the image and text that were particularly glaring and almost pixelated. What in the ever-living heck is this? There's some rare misprints. So... How much will you give me for them? I could feel the tension headache coming on. Look, dude, I hate to break it to you, but these are not legit. Have you even felt these? Like, check this out. There's a regular magic card, right? And see how thick and beefy it feels compared to this. This? Wafer, you're showing me? I told you, they're misprints. Just because they're misprints doesn't mean they change the paper that they are printed on. These are obviously fake, dude. What do you mean they're fake? They're fake. We're not real. Counterfeit. You got conned. I don't know where you got these, but it's not the real deal. I'm not buying these, and if I were you, I'd find the guy who sold you them and demand your money or cards back. The magic nerd left in a huff, gathering up his flaccid card collection in his cheese-stained fingers. By his reaction, I wondered for a minute if he just didn't run them off at home himself and thought that he could pull a fast one on the store, get some quick bucks at our expense, and never come back. Well, when he had stormed off into the abyss of the shop, presumably never to be seen again, I opened my comic book to resume the panel that I had left off on. And it wasn't long for this world, however. Don't trade with this guy, everyone. He's pushing fake trading cards. The printer. Screw you, they're not fake. I told you, they're misprints. I wouldn't expect a plebeian like you to know anything about misprints anyways. I let out a sigh once again, bookmarked my comic, took a look at what was happening, and the guy who had tried to cash in on his cards had confronted another nerd, a tiny little string bean looking grabbler, shoving him back into his seat as he stood up to get confrontational with him. Honestly, string bean had some guts trying to face off with big boy and that he had upset. How, but as soon as he hit that hard plastic, I could see he was thinking twice very quickly. A gaggle of greasy little game shop goblins had gathered around the grifter, no longer pursuing the binders of rare cards that the printer had set out for on the display. But instead, soaking in the drama of the moment like it was a Spanish telenovela. Hey, they're not fake. Then why is the shop not taking them and telling me that they are fake, huh? Explain that! 
things got quiet as all of the nerdcasts all look over to me. I got up from behind the counter and walked slowly to the, to the table. Are these your binders? Yeah. I reach in and produced another card from its plastic sleeve. The same flimsy, flexible, fake cards filled the folio. He had a ton of stuff straight out of the current meta and all sorts of rare tidbits from older sets throughout the years. As I flipped through it, I even saw one with smeared ink on it, presumably handled before it had a chance to dry. Look, I'm just gonna say it straight, these are obviously not real. Everyone, you can check for yourself. The cards aren't even made out of the same material as regular card. Misprint or not, that alone ought to tell you you're being conned. How many cards did you get off my customers, dude? The printer looked shy as a lich mob of angry mages formed around him. A circle of faces with gnashing teeth, stubbly hair, and festering acne. Some people turning red with boiling hot nerd rage. Honestly, I was surprised that nobody had called him out for him pushing fakes sooner. Perhaps nobody had the stones to do it and decided to humor his lies in good faith, thinking that maybe even if they were fake, they could offload them onto the shop somehow to mitigate their losses, maybe to cash in on the con. Now, however, that the accusation had been leveled, a chorus of voices started up from my patrons, lobbing inflammatory accusations at one card printer. Yeah, these do feel kind of thin, don't they? What's up with that? You sus OB, give me back my Requiry Tower. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I told you guys from the start, you shouldn't have trusted him. The colors started to drain from the printer's face as he realized that his jig was up and he was cornered. He produced a folder full of cards that he had built other people out of. And I had to stand and supervise the procession as one at a time. People came up to the thief, flinging the obviously fake printouts at the counterfeiter and demanding their inventory of cards back. Finally, when the arduous group was shaming was done, I told him to get up from his seat, grab his things, and never come back to my store. Eventually, Manny came out to see what all the ruckus was about, and when I told him what had transpired, we both had a good laugh about everything. You would think that would be the end of the story, right? Clearly, it's not. However, because I just broke this sentence. Let's fast forward a couple of days, and now it is Sunday. Sundays are another chill day for the store. And this Sunday, it was just me until close when Manny would come in, count the till, and lock up. On Sundays, we just get the RPG crowd, and they keep to themselves in their little self-contained cliques. God, I love the RPG crowd. They're just so self-contained and not needy, you know? Anyways, I'm lost in some book as usual, waiting for a customer to come up and need my attention, or whatever asinine reason. When I hear the door chime ring and hurried footsteps come up to the shop, I mumble the usual greetings to this new individual, not even looking up from my comic. Welcome to LGS. If you need help, just ask. I want to speak to the manager right now. Ah, oh boy, here we go. I thought as I set up the comic book down from the display case, I looked up to see a middle-aged woman with one of those bizarre pixie-esque style haircuts that sloped to one side and thick black sunglasses that obscured her presumably bulging eyes. She was exuding all of the energy of a pit bull ready to maul a helpless child. Her nostrils flared with seething anger, and her lips curled into a wry smile. And behind her stalked her seedy little son, who, surprise, was the printer. Now, Manny held the line six days of the week out of seven, and only came in on number seven to count the till and lock up the store at the end of the night. I can understand that he didn't want to deal with this, having to already spend every waking moment here making sure the store didn't burn down. In that moment, I remembered what Manny told me when I first began to work Sunday shifts. Manny, echoing across time and space, if anyone comes in on a Sunday and they're looking for the manager, OP, you just go ahead and tell them that you are the manager, okay? You've got good judgment, so I know that I can trust you on whatever needs to be done. 
I mulled over my options. I could just run with Manny's proposition, of course. I could call Manny up and ruin his only day off. And But that just felt surprisingly petty to me. Even for a money-drinking cesspit like him. I could just be honest and say that he wasn't here, but then somebody would have to suffer whatever tirade this woman prepared at some point in the future, and I did not want to hear that nails-on-chalkboard voice ever again. I tried option A. Yeah, that's me. How can I help you? Karen let out a loud harumph, a kind of like how I'd expect a mid-16th century English gentleman to express disdain for some street urchin over whom they believed they held power before launching into her monocle-popping tirade. My son tells me that he was here only two days ago, and he got banned from the store because an employee accused him of trying to sell fake cards. Yeah, he was here. His cards were fake, and I banned him from the store. What of it? Well, I know my son, and he isn't dishonest. He wouldn't lie about something like that. Okay, well then, he's lying to you too. I could see Karen recoil at even this tepid resistance to her whims. Her voice rose a decibel level to end an octave as she came back hot. Like heck it is. He's never lied to me in his life. Well then, he just started doing it. That's a problem for you and him to sort out. B.S. He's lying to me. I give him money every week to go and buy some cards. What else would he spend all of it on? Of course his cards are authentic. I sighed. I don't know what he would spend it on. A printer? Crack? Who cares? Ask him about where your money is going, not me. I'll say it again since you seem to be slow on the uptake. He came in here with fake merchandise and conned my patrons, and he got, got, got caught doing it. We are not buying anything from him, and he is not welcome back, and you are not going to change my mind about it. Karen's jaws quivered with angry cellulose, and her veins began to nod on her forehead. I could hear her seething bovine respirations. She was digging for something, anything, which she could then strong-arm the situation and make me bend to her will. She wanted her sweet little boo-boo to run a con operation on the store, and already operated on threadbare margins, and expected us to smile and nod and beg for more while he did it until everybody who worked here was pushed out of the market and her little honey boo was counting stacks of cash laughing at us. Well, well, I want to speak to the owner then. Daring today, aren't we? I smiled wide. I am the owner. She's lying, Mom. I've met the owner. His name is Manny, not her. She's just some loser who works here. At that point, I let out a deep breath and collected myself. I could see the various RPG nerds poking their heads up from the table, watching the scene unfolding at the register with curiosity. You know what? Yes. Yes, I am lying to you. How awful that is. I am in fact not the owner. I'm not even the manager. But I'll tell you now that the owner agreed with my decision to not only not buy from your son, but remove him permanently from the premises. Perhaps you should make a statement about it on Yelp and take your money and your cards elsewhere then. This broke his mom. In all of her vitriol, she still had dung on to that final trump card. The words that no business owner ever want to hear. The boycott. Of course, there's a couple of problems with this proposition in regards to our store. We are the only LGS for nearly 60 miles, and the crowd she would muster to boycott us wasn't our customer base anyway. Never mind that despite how much of a gremlin Manny actually is, for some reason, he has his fanboys among the people who frequently shop. You can't discount loyalty like that. The quivering of her jowls reached a feverish pitch as the folds clapped against one another in futile, sweat-soaked rage. She let out a shriek like a wounded animal, grabbed her son, and left with her parting words. I'll have your business for this. You'll see. When Manny came in later in that evening to count the till and lock up shop, 
I told him about the day's encounter. He thought it was the funniest thing in the whole damn world. Then he told me to kick rocks and head home and that he'd see me next week. It's been a couple of weeks now and nothing has come out of it. The store is as busy as ever and nobody misses the evicted grifter. This is a friendly reminder to everyone out there to not yield to the impotent rage of others. To keep your impotent rage to yourself and that maybe, maybe, you shouldn't try to bully people into accepting your cons. I'll get at you guys when I have another story to tell. Doses. Unfortunately, people like that are a little too common in retail where they think that they can just bully the cashier or do whatever they want because this person's getting paid for it so they can't exactly respond. Well, you know what? I'm not exactly going to give really give much of a shit about you so you can get all angry and huffy you want. You're not going to touch me because if you do, you're going to be going out in handcuffs. The most you can do is get all pissy and uh, all, you know, upset in your own mind. But with that, that is going to have to be with the video. If you guys would love to be absolutely amazing, show your support and see more videos like this one in the near future, be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment down below to start up them wholesome internet discussions, and if you guys have not already, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications. Also, check out the videos in the end card if you like these ones, there's a playlist with more of them. But I'll be sure to see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for watching, and bye bye